What's going on, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Hashing Out the Draft presented by Inside the Hashes, your home for all of the insight into your favorite 2021 NFL draft prospects. I'm your host, Ben Schwartz, and today we're going to be taking a closer look at Alabama quarterback Mac Jones, Alabama running back Najee Harris, Auburn wide receiver Seth Williams, Indiana wide receiver Ty Freifogel, and Tennessee offensive lineman Trey Smith. Before we get going, please feel free to like and comment on this video. Also, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you can catch all of Inside the Hash's great NFL Draft content. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode of Hashing Out the Draft. So, without further ado, let's hash it out. Mac Jones, a 6'3", 214-pound junior, spent the first two years of his college career sitting behind last year's number 5 overall pick in the NFL Draft, Tua Tagovailoa. To say Jones has made the most out of his one year as the full-time starter for Nick Saban's Crimson Tide would be a massive understatement. The former three-star prospect out of the Bowles School in Jacksonville, Florida, has vaulted himself into a select group of Heisman contenders by completing 75.7% of his passes for 3,113 yards, 27 touchdowns, and only three interceptions in nine games. Jones has been one of, if not the best statistical quarterback in the nation this year. Out of all quarterbacks, Jones ranks fourth in yards, third in touchdowns, second in completion percentage, second in average yards per attempt, and first in QBR. The junior quarterback has shown that he has all of the abilities to be a successful pocket passer in the NFL. To go along with a strong arm that allows him to make throws down and across the field, Jones has exhibited great accuracy on his passes, landing them just within the catch radius of his receivers and out of reach of the defenders. The Alabama quarterback has also shown his superior pocket presence throughout the season. Countless times this season when faced with pressure and a closing pocket, Jones has calmly and confidently been able to step up and move throughout the pocket to get a position where he can deliver an accurate throw. The biggest hole in Mac Jones' game is his lack of mobility. Jones is not someone who uses athleticism to his advantage, meaning he may not fit in some of the more modern NFL offenses. The NFL is becoming a quicker paced game full of quarterbacks who are able to improvise when a play breaks down and create a new opportunity to salvage some positive yards. While Jones serves as an extremely effective distributor for playmakers, he must work on his ability to leave the pocket and create when the pocket collapses or his first options are not available. In one of Alabama's previous games this year against Auburn, Jones showed many positive signs that he could be successful at the next level. Early in the game, during a second and long situation, Jones was under pressure and made a throw downfield to a smothered receiver. Instead of throwing the ball to a place the receiver and the defender covering might be able to catch it, increasing the chance that the pass would get intercepted, Jones threw it out of reach, opting to not force a throw into a tight window. Here, Jones showcased his advanced intellect and decision-making capabilities, a skill NFL teams value highly in their quarterbacks. Later in the game, on a third and short opportunity, Jones rolled out of the pocket as he looked for an open receiver. With no options available, Jones decided to turn upfield and get the first down with his feet. Even though he is not considered a mobile quarterback or much of an athlete at all, Jones showed scouts that he is able to improvise and use his legs when necessary. One final example of Jones' NFL-ready skills came on a second and six midway through the second quarter. After taking a three-step drop out of the shotgun, Jones senses the pressure closing in on him from Auburn's edge rushers, steps up in the pocket, and delivers a beautiful touch pass just within the catch radius of the receiver, who is able to run it in for a score. Currently, Jones is not projected to be selected in the first round as one of the first three or four quarterbacks taken off the board. Instead, various mock drafts rate him as the fifth or sixth best quarterback in the draft, suggesting he will be taken somewhere in the middle rounds. It should be noted that while Jones has been masterful in the pocket this year, he is playing with other offensive studs such as running back Najee Harris, wide receivers Devonta Smith and Jalen Waddell, who played the first half of the season before getting injured, and the PFF top 10 ranked offensive line. However, Jones still has to get the ball to his playmakers, something he has done effectively all year long. Without a doubt, Mac Jones' numbers this year have been given a huge boost from being a part of that superb Crimson Tide offense. Having three offensive skill players potentially being drafted in the first round and a top 10 offensive line protecting him, that's any college quarterback's dream scenario. But aside from that, 
someone still has to be able to distribute the ball to those playmakers. And that's where Jones has stepped in perfectly. Jones has exhibited superior decision-making abilities, great composure out of the pocket, and a sense of maturity that NFL scouts have to be loving. That's why I expect Jones to be the fifth or sixth quarterback taken off the board, likely somewhere in the middle rounds. Now, let's take a closer look at Alabama running back Najee Harris. Alabama running back Najee Harris has been a national sensation for years now. Clips of the five-star recruits high school highlights, which show Harris constantly running over, around, and right by defenders, went viral during his senior year at Antioch High School in California. Now, Harris is an established star on one of the best offenses in college football, and this year, he has elevated his play to another level, putting together an incredible season that has him in the conversation for the Heisman. Through nine games, the senior running back has rushed for 1,038 yards on 169 carries, good for an insane 6.1 yards per carry, which ranks 13th among all players with 100 or more carries this season. On top of that, Harris has proven he has a knack for finding the end zone as he leads the nation in touchdowns with 20, averaging over two per game. Harris has also hauled in 26 catches for 247 yards, proving his viability as a receiving option out of the backfield. Harris is an absolute monster on the field. Standing at six foot two and weighing 230 pounds, Harris's build resembles that of former Heisman winner and Alabama running back, Derrick Henry, who is only an inch taller and eight pounds heavier. What makes Harris so good, aside from his monstrous build, is his ability to run with great speed, elusiveness, and aggression. Harris, like Derrick Henry, is a complete runner, equipped with the burst and acceleration to get to the outside and second level of the defense, the agility and balance needed to make quick cuts, and the power to bowl over defenders. This skill set has NFL scouts salivating over his potential to be successful at the next level. Take a look at this run from Harris during the Iron Bowl two weeks ago. After taking the handoff from quarterback Mac Jones, Harris waits for a hole to open and actually has two to choose from. Instead of going left and fitting into a smaller hole with more defenders at the second level, Harris makes a sharp cut to burst through the other gap on the right side of the line. Once he's through, he uses his speed to get to the outside and bring it all the way for a score. Let's check out this other impressive run from Harris during Alabama's game against Ole Miss this season, a game in which Harris scored five touchdowns. While this run is not one of those touchdowns and does not seem like anything more than a nice game, it showcases some of Najee Harris's best abilities. On this carry, the big running back is able to show his patience, footwork, and power that makes him such a special prospect. One final piece of film highlighting Harris's strengths come from Alabama's game versus Tennessee this season. On this play, Harris rolls out of the backfield to the left and makes a catch from quarterback Mac Jones. He then proceeds to make a group of Tennessee defenders look silly by sidestepping and juking his way to the first down marker, not going down until he has crossed the first down line. This play once again highlights Harris's agility and his ability to make plays out of the backfield and get extra yards after the catch. Combine that with his build and that is a recipe for a scary running back. It is difficult to find any weaknesses in Harris's game. Coming into this season, many believed Harris had a lot of room to grow as a receiver, but his performance this season has quieted many doubters of his ability to catch balls out of the backfield. Najee Harris certainly fits the mold of a top running back. For the team that drafts Najee Harris, they can expect to be adding a workhorse three down back to their offensive personnel. Over the last couple years at Alabama, Harris has been able to bulldoze through the trenches, get to the outside and beat defenders to the edge, and catch passes out of the backfield. That kind of versatility combined with a Derrick Henry type build is going to make Harris a very valuable asset in the NFL. I think Harris is going to be drafted somewhere towards the end of the first round and beginning of the second round as the first or second running back taken off the board. Look to a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers who might be losing their starting running back James Conner in free agency to pick him up in that spot. Next, we're going to be taking a look at Auburn wide receiver, Seth Williams. In nine games this year, Auburn wideout Seth Williams has racked up 631 yards and three touchdowns on 39 catches, good for just over 16 yards per catch. With these numbers, Williams ranks 39th in yards, 57th in catches, outside the top 125 in touchdowns, and 82nd in yards per catch for all receivers across the country. Within the SEC, the 6'3", 211-pound junior ranks 9th in yards, 11th in catches, 18th in touchdowns, and 10th in yards per catch. Williams, who was selected to the All-SEC third team last season, 
is one of the most physically gifted receivers in the 2021 draft class. Arguably his strongest trait as a receiver is his ability to high point the football in the air and come down with contested catches. While his height and vertical jumping ability play a large role in Williams being able to come down with these 50-50 balls, it is his strong hands that make it so hard for receivers to break up passes that are already in his catch radius. This is beneficial for Williams when running deep routes on the outside or up the seam, but also for his middle to short range routes. When running across the field to make catches, Williams' hands help him snatch bullet passes out of the air and maintain possession when hitting the ground or absorbing hits from defenders. Another reason why Williams will hear his name called in April is because of his potential to be a serious red zone threat at the next level. His height alone already gives him an advantage when running routes in the red zone and during goal-to-go situations, but when you combine that with the aforementioned leaping ability and strong hands, Williams could be the perfect guy to target on a goal line fade or 15 to 20 yard slant or corner route in the red zone. His physical gifts give the quarterback a much larger window to throw the ball that is further away from the defensive back covering. Looking back to the 2019 season, Williams was prone to not staying engaged in the play after his route had broken down or the quarterback had rolled out or shifted to the other side of the field. However, this year, there have been signs that Williams has improved on this aspect of his game. Let's take a closer look at a play from Auburn's previous game against Texas A&M. During this play, which has become known as one of the craziest touchdowns of the year because of Bo Nix's effort to get in the end zone, Williams started running a route up the middle, and once it became clear that the original play broke down and Nix would have to improvise, Williams continued to move around the end zone to try to be an open option for Nix. This example from Williams proves he has worked on this aspect of his game and is becoming a smarter receiver. However, with all these strengths and points of improvement, also come some weaknesses that have prevented Williams from being considered as one of the top receivers coming out of college, like LSU's Jamar Chase and Alabama's Devonta Smith and Jalen Waddell. Despite his ability to make these contested catches, Williams finds himself having to fight for balls in the air far too often because of his struggles creating space from defensive backs. While he is fast, Williams does lack some explosiveness off the snap, and his route running skills are not on par with the other top receivers in his class. This could present a problem for Williams at the next level because of the increase in quality, size, and strength of the corners and safeties he will be lining up against. There will be less opportunities for the Auburn wideout to use his size advantage, so he will have to rely more on his ability to create space and run effective routes. Seth Williams is definitely an interesting case coming into this year's draft and a player that I'm not quite so sure how to feel about yet. The Auburn wide receiver was so highly touted coming into this year, and many expected him to be not just one of the best receivers in the SEC, but one of the best receivers in the entire country. Unfortunately, a lot of the production that was expected just hasn't been there. While there's been a lot of bright spots, there's been a lot of dull moments as well. Most notably, his performance against South Carolina's projected first-round corner, J.C. Horn. While his poor performance in that game might speak a little bit about his NFL readiness, Williams does still have a lot of time to grow and a lot of places for improvement and that can be helped along with some good coaching. While he's able to use his physical gifts to snatch balls out of the air and beat receivers downfield, Williams does lack a little bit of that explosiveness off the line of scrimmage that allows receivers to create space against the defenders and some route running abilities. Overall, I think Williams can still be a solid receiver in the NFL, but he might require a little more coaching. Next up, let's take a closer look at Indiana wide receiver Ty Freifogel. Ty Freifogel is quietly having one of the best seasons of any wide receiver in the Big Ten and even around the country. Although fellow Indiana receiver Wap Fillier may be getting more attention from NFL scouts, it is Freifogel, the 6'2", 214-pound senior, who is putting up the bigger numbers. In seven games this year, Freifogel has racked up 687 yards and seven touchdowns on 34 catches, good for just over 20 yards per catch. Across the country, Freifogel ranks 23rd for yards, 17th in yards per catch, and 20th in touchdowns. In the Big Ten, Freifogel ranks first in yards, second in touchdowns, and ninth in receptions. What's even crazier is that a majority of this production came in Freifogel's second, third, and fourth games of the season. These three games account for 25 of the 34 catches, 560 of the 687 yards, and six of his seven touchdowns. Indiana's game against Ohio State on November 21st, the third of that torrent three-game stretch, has been the defining moment of Freifogel's senior season so far. Overall, Freifogel posted his second straight 200-yard performance, finishing with 218 on seven catches, three of which resulted in touchdowns. 
What makes this performance even more impressive is that for much of the game, Freifogel was lined up across from Ohio State cornerback Sean Wade, who is projected as a first round pick. Let's take a closer look at some of his plays during this game. Throughout the game, Freifogel displayed comfort op operating out of the slot and on the outside. This versatility could allow Freifogel to take advantage of size mismatches in the future if he lines up against smaller or slower players in different parts of the field. On his first target of the day, Freifogel battled Wade who was in tight man coverage and was able to create space and make an acrobatic catch. This is an area of the Indiana wide receivers game that he is not as well known for, but having the footwork, agility, and route running skills to create space from defenders, especially ones as talented as Wade, will translate well to the NFL. On his first touchdown of the day, Freifogel took advantage of a missed coverage assignment out of the slot, finding himself open up the seam, and after breaking a tackle, he used a boost of speed to get by two other defenders and run it in for a score. Overall, this is a very impressive play from the senior receiver. For his second touchdown, once again working out of the slot, Freifogel showed his intelligence as a receiver when he cuts up field as the safeties are creeping in. On the back end of the play, Freifogel displayed his ability to control his landing spot as he made a contested toe-tap catch in the back of the end zone. Freifogel's third and final touchdown of the afternoon was his most impressive. Lined up on the outside across from Wade who was in man coverage, Freifogel ran a simple streak and mossed the Ohio State corner, drawing a defensive pass interference in the process and running it in for the score. Currently, the Indiana receiver is projected as a late round pick. But if Freifogel can prove to be a productive outside of that three-game stretch and continue to execute as he did in the game against Ohio State, he will most likely move into the middle rounds, or one team is going to get themselves a steal of a receiver late in the draft. Ty Freifogel is one of the most underrated receivers in the country this year. All he's done all season is absolutely dominate Big Ten secondaries, hopefully moving him up on a lot of people's draft boards after he was projected as a late-round pick earlier in the season. The Indiana wide receiver has huge big play potential. He's able to beat defensive backs on the outside and make acrobatic catches at the high point. He also has a lot of good mid to short range capabilities as he's e easily able to create space from defenders and get his feet down in the right spots. Like I just said, Fry Fogel was earlier projected as only a late round pick, but after his great performances earlier in the season, I could see Fry Fogel going in the mid middle rounds, maybe not with that top group of receivers, but certainly in the next couple groups. Last but not least, let's take a closer look at Tennessee offensive lineman Trey Smith. Coming out of high school at University School of Jackson in Jackson, Tennessee, Trey Smith was a five-star prospect rated as one of the top 15 high school players in the country by 24-7. Now, as a senior at the University of Tennessee, the 6'6", 325-pound offensive lineman is one of the most highly touted offensive line prospects entering the 2021 NFL Draft. There's a lot to like about Trey Smith, both on the field and off the field. Let's start with his on-field performance. Over the course of the last four years at Tennessee, Smith has missed only five games, playing in 40 and starting 39. This is proof of his incredible durability, a key for offensive linemen in the NFL. In addition, through eight games this season, the Tennessee native has not missed a snap, committed only one penalty, and allowed just one sack. Smith is a force to be reckoned with in the run game, as he has terrific power at the point of attack. He excels when leveraging his hips and using his hands to move defenders off their lines and out of the gaps created for the running back. Smith has also demonstrated a great ability to climb up the field and connect with blocks on the second level, often springing his backs for big gains. While the run game suits Smith better, he still does great work on passing situations. Smith showcases a healthy aggression and desire to put defenders on their back when delivering powerful punches off the snap. The combination of Smith's size and experience, which has likely led him to see all different sorts of pass rushes, allows him to diagnose the move a pass rusher is about to try and come up with an effective way to protect the quarterback. Despite all these strengths, there are still areas of improvement for the senior lineman, especially in the pass game. Smith's feet can seem heavy at times, and his lateral movement skills are below average. He struggles to slide his feet and stay in front when facing quicker interior rushers that can challenge his edges and get around him. With higher quality linemen at the next level, Smith might need to develop quicker feet and potentially lose some weight in order to be able to keep pace with NFL talent. 
Off the field, Trey Smith has shown characteristics that many NFL teams are surely looking for in the young players they will be adding to their organizations. As previously mentioned, in 2018, after starting the first seven games of the season, Smith was sidelined for the rest of the season due to blood clots. However, instead of letting this nearly career-ending injury affect his play, all Smith did during the next season was play all 13 games, starting in 12 of them, and get selected to the All-SEC First Team. During that season, the Tennessee big man did not allow a single sack and became one of the nation's top offensive guards in the second half of the year, leading the Vols to six straight victories. In fact, from Week 8 on, Smith was the second highest graded Power 5 guard in the nation, according to PFF. Smith has shown that when he is faced with adversity, he is not afraid to bulldoze through the obstacles in his life and is dedicated to being the best version of himself on the field. Coming back from a serious injury is impressive, but returning to form and improving your play following that injury is truly remarkable. Furthermore, Smith has been a champion of others off the field as well. Last season, he was awarded the Jason Witten Collegiate Man of the Year Award, which is presented to the college player demonstrating exceptional leadership, courage, and integrity, as well as the inaugural Fritz Pollard Trophy, given to the collegiate player who has exemplified extraordinary courage, community values, and exceptional performance on the field. It is clear that for the franchise that drafts Smith, not only will they be gaining an exceptional talent on the offensive line, but also an exceptional person that will be a leader in the locker room and have a positive impact on the surrounding community. If I had to use two words to describe Tennessee's Trey Smith's style of play, they would be drive and power. In the run game, right off the snap, Smith is able to drive defenders back into the second level of the defense and create huge holes for his running backs to go through. In the passing game, Smith is very powerful when delivering that first punch to defenders trying to bull rush him, but some of the weaknesses in his game also come in the passing situations. Smith's feet are not the quickest, and he does lack some lateral movement, meaning some edge rushers and interior linemen that are a little quicker are going to be able to get around him. I'll be very interesting to see how Smith performs in the combine, especially in speed and agility drills. It'll be a good look to see if he's worked on some of these weaknesses before the NFL draft. If Smith has worked on these, I can see him being a ready plug-in for any offensive line on week one for a new team. His skills might only be transferable to a guard position, though, because of that lack of movement, so left or right tackle might be out of play. If there's a player not mentioned in today's video that you'd like to see broken down, make sure to comment their name below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to stay up to date on all of Inside the Hash's great content. And please feel free to check out our website, InsideTheHashes.com. Once again, I'm your host, Ben Schwartz, and I hope you tune in next week so we can continue hashing out the draft.